Hello. In the last lecture, we were talking about vibrations as it applies to microsystems, because this is part of the micro and smart systems course. We were looking at vibrations which are everywhere and now we wanted to see their relevance in microsystems. We had discussed a number of things related to vibrations and uh, we will just briefly review what we had discussed in the last lecture and finish up one small concept of bandwidth that we were discussing towards the end of that last lecture and then continue today with another topic related to vibrations called the micro machine gyroscopes. Let us quickly review the vibrations that we had discussed last time and uh, first we had discussed the motivation for studying vibrations in the context of microsystems. So, this is an accelerometer, a chip and this is a gyroscope that we will talk about today and here is a mirror that tilts about two axes that is as shown here rotation about this axis that is a y axis if you call vertical axis and horizontal axis and there is a mirror about a single axis this can tilt. So, that is another one these are two axis mirror this single axis all these are dynamic systems they undergo small motions which we call vibrations. So, towards that we discussed uh, if we just quickly go through uh, the concepts that we had discussed uh, in the context of last lecture. Okay, let us see, let us bring up the last lecture here. Okay, we started with the concept of harmonic motion, which is simply there is a spring and a mass and the equation of motion for that is as shown here. Okay, m x double dot plus k x equal to force that is applied. We said that when the force is equal to 0, we call it free vibration is the free vibration and then when there is force then we call it force vibration when there is arbitrary forces we generally call it a dynamic response. So, free and force vibrations are special cases of what can be called dynamic response. In the case of free vibration we saw a general solution for it which is composed of sine and cosine terms and uh, we had define the concept of natural frequency that is left to itself this spring mass system will be vibrating at a certain frequency going back and forth that is time period that is one time period inverse of that is the frequency. So, formula for that is square root of k over m where k is a stiffness and m is the inertia. We discussed how we can obtain the stiffness for a given complicated system. However, complicated it is, it may be we can always lump it to a single degree of freedom if it is possible, then there is just one spring and one mass, the mass counts as inertia, k turns out to be stiffness and we said that we do that in a way that enables us to do this. That is, when do we say the stiffness is k for a system? If half k times displacement square is equal to the strain energy stored in that complex elastic system, then that is the lumped stiffness which we can call k effective. We just recalling what we had discussed in the last lecture. If the strain energy stored in an elastic system, if that can be expressed as half k effective times displacement square, then that is the k effective. Similarly, for inertia we use kinetic energy. So, we have this k e kinetic energy and we say that when we have a system which we can express as half m effective y dot square if we do that ok. This is the effective inertia and y dot is the velocity of the degree of freedom that we are looking at in the lumped model. If we can do that then that is the m effective. In order to do that we have to do this integration by taking mass per unit length in the case of a beam if it is a general 3D structure mass per unit volume times the velocity square of that one and then integrate over the entire volume uh, get the numerical value you know y dot 
then you can get m effective. Once you know k effective and m effective, you can compute the natural frequency for free vibration. We had done a small calculation for a beam such as this, if the mass of the beam is m, only 48 percent of it participates in the vibration, because all of the beam is not vibrating by the same amount, because this point is fixed, this point is fixed, right. So, this point is the one that is going to have lot of displacement and other points have less displacement. So, overall it amounts to only less than 50 percent of the mass actually moves. If we take the maximum displacement as your y, a reference displacement in the lumped model that is what we had discussed and then we moved on to adding a damper the system. Now, this is the new element damper. We talked about how to get k effective m effective and then we have this damping coefficient c. In a future lecture, uh, we will discuss ways to compute c effective, okay. but today after reviewing this, we are going to start on a vibration related topic which is micro machine gyroscopes. So, this c x dot term influence we had considered, earlier we had a solution without this term, now we wrote a solution after introducing this term. For that we use Laplace transform technique to come up with the solution. This is the general solution of this system and then we also classified it in three different ways, one over damped, two critically damped and three under damped, defined a damping quotient coefficient which is damping ratio which we said is uh, given by the quantity that we have indicated here where c square c c square critically damped ratio that square divided by 4 m square when it is equal to k m that will be damping coefficient 1. Anything else it will be more than 1 if there is more damping less than 1 if there is less damping. So, we had defined this uh, damping ratio and we actually saw the importance of this damping ratio. This is a second order system if I perturb that a little bit like in a free vibration then it would start at some value and the amplitude as it oscillates is going to reduce and that is where this damping ratio lies. There is omega n which is the natural frequency which is dependent on only k effective and inertia effective m effective whereas damping ratio decides how this amplitude actually decreases and we had seen that analytically as well as graphically here and then defined a concept of damped natural frequency and how we can determine this in experiments for that we defined the concept of logarithmic decrement which is simply the ratio of successive displacements in the in one period time. That is if I take a point here exactly after some time this point may correspond to somewhere here. So, this time period if I take okay, if I see the displacement x 1 and x 2 here if I take the natural logarithm of that, that is equal to this damping ratio times omega n and then the time period itself. Okay. So, based on this we can compute once we know this damping ratio, we can compute the damping coefficient which is a c. As we saw in the previous slide, damping ratio is equal to 1 when this c the damping coefficient is critically damped. So, we say 1 this divided by whatever damping coefficient. So, if we know once we know c c if it is more than 1 we will get the appropriate damping coefficient c for the system. And then we started talking about forced vibration when there is a force on the right hand side as opposed to being 0 in the free vibrations. Now, we have a non-zero value for the force. Then we noted the analytical solution for that where there is amplitude and phase because analytical solution will have x equal to this is the amplitude x and then we have a phase if omega is applied natural frequency will be offset from that because the force is applied at some way and then there will be offset in the resulting displacements. So, the expressions are given over here and then we try to normalize it by dividing by natural frequency and we try to see how that curve is going to look like. That is where we ended the last lecture. 
So, it is a quick review of what we did earlier because that is important for what we are going to discuss today. So, if I do that amplitude ratio k x divided by force that is like a normalized quantity. If I plot it with frequency on the x axis, okay, it is going to look like this. The first one here is over damped and then there is this is over damped. And this is critically damped, the red one that we have said is critical damping and then there is all this is, this is zeta equal to 0, damping ratio 0 is actually no damping. When there is no damping, you see that we go to infinity, the amplitude is going to be really high which is what we call resonance, a term that we had discussed last time that most of you must be familiar with. And then all these other curves are under damped, they are under damped meaning that they are damped less than their critical damping that is damping ratio being equal to 1. So, this has lot of significance when it comes to sensor design for that let us just go to the place where we had left it. Okay. So, the same ratio that k x by f naught if I plot it on the log scale as shown uh, over here. Uh, we see that, okay. So let's, uh, okay. But that is log scale, and so is this. This is the frequency, omega divided by omega n natural frequency. It is one. That's where the resonance occurs. And you see when you log log plot, if you do that, there is a portion which is constant, and then it goes like this real experimental results also look like this. When you were to take a frequency response of a dynamic system, you would normally see this. There could be more than one natural frequency, then you will see more peaks like this. But important here, what we call bandwidth is the portion of the frequency response that is independent of the frequency. So, if you have an accelerometer, if accelerometer will sense acceleration, but the acceleration that is sensed if it is going to vary with time. Let us say the acceleration that I am sensing has a a naught and then cos omega t. So, it has its own frequency dependence, right? but I am interested in measuring this acceleration because I want to measure vibration. Vibration always will have this harmonic motion. So, I want to measure this a naught, right? but since that is varying with time harmonically because I am vibrating and I am putting my accelerometer over it, then I am not interested in the frequency part, I am interested in the amplitude part. But if I have a sensor that gives me this a magnitude as it varies from uh, minus a naught to plus a naught because of cos omega t here, I am not interested in that. I am interested in this amplitude, so that is why we need to pick a sensor that is independent. Now, you see whatever is the frequency omega, this amplitude ratio is constant and that is called the bandwidth. So, this is the range of frequencies, bandwidth refers to range of frequencies over which the sensor gives correct or reliable amplitude information amplitude information. Okay. So, imagine that if I had two signals, so this is A1, let us say this is, uh, let us call it A1 naught and then let us say I have another signal A2, A2 naught cosine omega 2t, let us say this is 1t. Both of them at some point can have the same a 1, A 2 value, whereas A 1 naught and A 2 naught may be different. If my interest is to measure these, that difference will show up in this case, because if this is A 1 naught, okay, A 2 naught if it is more, it is going to be something like this. right? So, I have precise difference between A 1 naught and A 2 naught, even though A 1, A 2 at different points may have the same amplitude. right? So, amplitude meaning that this is the signal amplitude. So, the bandwidth is an important concept in sensors, not just for accelerometers, but for any other 
sensor, pressure sensors, humidity sensors and gas sensors anything that you take if the signal itself is time varying then bandwidth is an important concept. As a thumb rule we normally take about one third because the log log scale here is where the 2 is there and 3 up to that point usually it is linear. So, if you take uh, say this is 0 0.2, this is 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, this goes to 1 log scale. So, about one third of the natural frequency you can take it as a bandwidth in practice as a thumb rule and that is how when you design it, uh, if you pay attention to the natural frequency of your system, the first natural frequency one third of that is a bandwidth. Over that frequency range starting from 0 to that value you will have amplitude information reliably given by your sensor. So, this is the concept that we had discussed in the last lecture. Today, we will continue with that uh, vibration uh, concept, uh, but we will uh, look at a related concept called gyroscopes. We have micro machined uh, gyroscopes, micro machined is an important uh, let us go back let us get the pen yeah. micro machined gyroscopes. Gyroscopes are available already they are used routinely in inertial navigation and many other applications, but now we are talking about micro machine gyroscopes where things are really small. To give you an idea of the size that we are talking about I have a chip gyroscope chip with me today I am going to show that to you now. So, here is that uh, gyroscope chip. You can see it on the tip of my index finger, very small uh, chip, hard to see, but it is right here, okay. it is very, very small, my index finger. So, let me, yeah, it is just a dot on my index finger, just like a mole. It is very small, its size would be, uh, you can, uh, let us say, see it about 5 millimeter by 5 millimeter and then thickness is about 2 millimeters very small. Inside that the sensor element will be much smaller, we need a microscope to see it properly, but the package device is what I am showing. Now, if I mount it on something let us say I put it on my hand as I tilt my hand like this it is going to tilt tell me at what rate my hand is being tilted. Similarly, if I mount it on a car and if the car is going to roll over then we will be able to detect that before it happens. So, corrective action can be taken. Similarly, I, if I put it in an airplane as airplane is going along it will tell me how much it is rolling, pitching and yawing. If you have multi axis gyroscopes like accelerometers you can have angular rate sensors to sense one axis, two axis and all three axis. So, we talk about this micro machine gyroscopes today. One thing that we note is that when you measure linear uh, motion we always use acceleration, we always use acceleration sensor. We measure acceleration because that effect will be seen as acceleration times four mass will give you the force and the effect of force comes as a deformation or a displacement which we measure and relate to acceleration. But when it comes to angular motion we do not measure angular acceleration whether it micro scale is it a, whether it is at micro scale or macro scale we do not measure it at uh, we do not measure angular acceleration instead we measure angular rate. We measure as it is shown here we measure angular rate a gyroscope is a sensor which measures the angular rate gyroscope gyro gyration is you know tilting like if you are dancing that is kind of gyrating. So, gyroscope measures angular angular rate measures angular rate that is some degree per second or radians per second that is a unit of angular rate. <coughs> it is a pertinent question to ask why do we measure angular rate instead of angular acceleration. Okay. There are a few reasons for it, one reason we will see it mathematically today. 
for that we will first consider the simplest angular rate sensors and that is called a Foucault pendulum. Pendulum designed and used by a person named Foucault, a French uh, engineer who noted that if you want to measure the angular rate of the earth's spinning. So, earth is rotating as we know if you want to measure the angular rate of the earth what do you do being on earth you want to measure it. So, for that he built this very long pendulum the very long wire he hung a very large weight, but here I am showing it is just like an apple or a mango tied to a string which is fixed here to a ceiling and then it is hanging and it is set to oscillate let us say along the red line. So, the red line I have shown here it is just a pendulum it is just oscillating. Okay. Now, if this frame this is the frame to which this one is attached if that frame starts rotating okay, with an angular rate omega. So, this is angular rate if this frame starts rotating then what happens to this mango that is hung from the ceiling we have set it to vibrate along a line like this in a plane. Okay. If we come back after some time that is it is going from here to red line and back and forth it is going like this what I have done is the red line I made it green now, but what happens after some time when this starts rotating is that it will change its plane of motion and start going there that is plane of oscillation rotates by an angle theta. If you measure this theta we can correlate this to this omega. Okay. Why does it happen? Normally in science museums there will be this huge pendulum attached to a high ceiling and it is set into motion like this let us say in the morning at 8 o'clock if you come back after 1 hour it would have changed its plane of motion to something like this and then after some time something like this. <coughs> it depends on the earth's rotation and based on the earth rotation that is a time measurement because earth finishes one spin in 24 hours. So, we can do a clock like this with Foucault pendulum that tells us at what rate the earth is rotating. What is the principle behind this and that is what is called Coriolis force or Coriolis acceleration. The Coriolis acceleration for the simple case is given by the mass of this mango or apple okay, m is the mass and this is as we already said is angular rate and this is the driving velocity. What is driving velocity? We said that we took this pendulum and started to put set it into motion. So, there is certain velocity for this mango as it goes back and forth here right that is the V drive driving velocity and this is angular rate and this Coriolis acceleration as you can see we have used the cross product when you have put this omega and V in bold face letters because omega is uh, a vector it has an amplitude omega and also a direction. If I call this direction upwards as my z axis this omega will be written as omega amplitude times the unit vector along the z axis whereas, x and y axis can be here the right handed system. And this velocity let us say originally we said this is how it is going if I call that y axis or its unit vector j hat okay, and this is i hat what we get is <coughs> that <coughs> omega which has excuse me omega which has the k along the z axis unit vector velocity v drive has j if I take the cross product of k cross j I will get a component in the ith direction or depending on the magnitude amplitudes the negative ith component that is what is oscillating like this suddenly starts having component in the perpendicular direction. So, equivalent of that it will start tilting that is if I have motion set like this because of Coriolis acceleration which is along the z axis here I start having a component like this. I have set the motion like this and now I start having a component of 
this drive uh, velocity that we given in this direction starts going in this direction. So, as a result it will start going across like this. Okay. So, I have set it like this and there is a component here it goes at some angle as it is shown in the diagram that is the principle of a gyroscope and that is the principle of Coriolis acceleration Coriolis force. In order to see this Coriolis uh, force let us switch to uh, our notepad and uh, see what uh, we can do about this Coriolis acceleration. So, now let us start from the very beginning to discuss what this Coriolis acceleration really is. Okay. Let us say we have a, a rod and on that we put a bar, on that we put a little slider. So, let us say this red one is a slider which can go back and forth along this rod. Let us say this rod is pivoted to a reference frame. Okay. So, that means that this thing can rotate this rod can rotate rigid rod and the slider can slide along this. Okay. If I take a point over here and say the coordinates of that points are x and y where this is let us say our y axis, this is our x axis. Okay. Let us say this point is p and that has coordinates x and y. Now, if this rod has angular motion theta and angular rate theta dot and angular acceleration theta double dot. So, theta dot is d theta by d t and theta double dot is d square theta by d t square. Okay. This is the angular rate which we want to measure. We still have not answered why we want to measure angular velocity as opposed to theta double dot which is angular acceleration. But when we finish the calculation that we are going to do on this simple system, we will have an answer to that question. Okay. Now, I am going to also tell you a simple tool for analyzing kinematics of planar system. This is a planar system in the sense that this rod is moving in the plane and the slider is moving along the rod which remains to be in the same plane. If we have that the position p we can represent that as a complex number. It is a very simple concept where the position x and y components of this because this is a coordinate system this thing is x here and this thing is y here because of the coordinates we can simply represent as a complex number. The advantage of representing like this is that if I were to indicate the distance along the rod where the slider is located if I call that k and this angle of course is already theta for us we can write this p also as k into e raise to i theta. Okay. So, where k is the distance from the origin to this point and times e raised to i theta because we know that uh, e raised to i theta is cosine theta plus i into sin theta where i of course is square root of negative 1. Okay. Now, this means that k cosine theta plus i k sin theta and this uh, k cosine theta is nothing but our x because if this were to be k if this is angle is theta then this horizontal this displacement here is k cosine theta right similarly this one is going to be k sin theta so according to what we had done earlier that's what we got here okay so it is legitimate to say that position p of this point we can write it as k into e power i theta. You will see why we are doing this. Okay. Now, if I want to know the velocity of that point p, I have to take differentiation of it. So, if I want to say the velocity, if it is a complex number, I am just adding this double line at the left side. 
if I want to get this v then I have to do derivative of this p with respect to time. So, we have derivative. So, we have k because it is sliding along the rod, rod k depends on time theta dependence on time. So, k and theta depend on time they vary with time ok. They depend on time means that they are variable with time. So, I have to take differentiation using product rule I will first say k dot e power i theta and then k into i theta dot e power i theta. That means that first I have taken product rule first d k by d t that is k dot and then e power i theta as it is and then kept k as it is and I take derivative of e power i theta which is e power i theta and then we have to take derivative of this which is i theta dot d theta by d t that is what we get that is a velocity. So, you have a component along the radial direction that is radial direction is this ok because the slider is going like this and then this rod is also rotating there is also a tangential component because e power i theta dot will be perpendicular to the one that does not have i ok because that is what we saw x and y they are perpendicular to each other components what has i and does not have i will be perpendicular to each other. So, now if I want to get the acceleration ok that is also a vector. So, I will have represent that as a complex number I have to do d v by d t or d square p by d t square ok. So, let us uh, write that that is equal to we already have two terms here ok. Now, note again that uh, both k and theta depend on time or vary with time. So, I have to take derivative of when I take derivative of this and I keep in mind that k dot also may vary with time theta will vary with time. So, I will first have k double dot e power i theta that is product rule 1 and then we will have k dot i theta dot e power i theta. So, that takes care of two terms that come because of this one and let us use a different color for terms due to uh, this one now ok. So, that this thing was the green one now we will write the purple for this term ok. So, there are k theta dot and e power theta three terms. So, we will have three terms coming here first we will take k dot ok and then i theta dot e power i, tha I theta remain the same that is the first term taken derivative. Now, we will take the second term that will have k i theta double dot e power i theta and then there will be another term which will be for this portion that will be k i square theta dot square e power i theta. Why do we have square? We already have i theta dot we will take derivative of this quantity I will get e power i theta times i times theta dot. So, we get this. So, if I write this back again. So, I will have k double dot e power i theta plus these two terms are the same. So, I can write it as 2 i k dot theta dot e power i theta plus I have k i k theta double dot e power i theta minus because this i square because square root of minus 1 is i, i square is minus 1 k theta dot square e power i theta. So, now we got four components for the acceleration. The first term that you see k double dot times e power i theta is what we can call linear acceleration. Okay. This is linear acceleration. Remember that rod is sliding uh, the sl block is sliding along the rod and that is linear acceleration and this portion which you can recognize as our centripetal acceleration. Notice that 
these two, the first and the fourth term do not have i in them, it just e power i theta is their direction, they are just going along the rod, but then these other two terms have i in them, they will be perpendicular. So, this one theta double dot is there, this is angular acceleration. angular acceleration and then we have this term which is called the Coriolis acceleration. So, Coriolis acceleration we saw earlier we had something like omega dot omega not dot just omega crossed with v ok. So, we have that theta dot is our omega and then k dot is our v. So, this is related to k dot, this is related to theta dot, we have the cross because the direction is already has come here. We had taken the angular rate perpendicular to the plane in what is above ok. If I have the angular rate is perpendicular to the plane of this screen here, when I take dot product of that with this velocity which is here we have to use right handed rule. So, we have this thumb going up along the angular rate and then we have uh, this going this way ok. That is this is our velocity direction, this thumb is the upward angular velocity direction. Then this one right handed rule cross product is going to be our oscillation. So, this is the angular rate and uh, this is the v and this is the perpendicular one to both of them is our uh, the Coriolis force direction. And now, we can see we come back to this equation right. So, if you look at this, this Coriolis acceleration depends on the angular rate as well as k dot. So, instead of measuring the effect of the angular acceleration with this theta double dot which is only k, changing the position of something is more difficult than changing the velocity especially if something is moving. We can control its uh, velocity better than the position. So, here we can think of this k dot which we set in the Foucault pendulum, we took the pendulum and set it into motion and then when there is angular rate of the frame, it started changing the plane of oscillation. So, that was a function of k dot, the how much what rate it goes depends on this k dot as much as it depends on theta dot. So, k dot can be seen as a gain in the system to measure. So, if you were to take this system and the rotating frame even if it has some angular acceleration, the contribution of that will be much smaller compared to the contribution of the Coriolis acceleration. That is usually the case, but when you are actually designing a gyroscope whether it is macro machine or micro machine, we have to take care that the contribution of the angular acceleration term, let us uh, go down to what we wrote this contribution should be uh, less than this contribution should be less than this term that is our interest Coriolis acceleration is our interest this should be negligible. So, you have to make sure that that is not going to dominate in other words position displacement k is not much that how far the block is from the pivot of the rod whereas this k dot is the velocity how fast is it moving ok. So, if you go back to the uh, Foucault pendulum example now, let us say what uh, we have this, this example, the velocity at which this moves ok uh, matters for us ok. So, the uh, velocity at which this moves is going to come in this v drive as we had already discussed, there is angular rate that force comes on this changes the plane of oscillation to that. But we are not going to use a pendulum in a micro machine system such as the chip that I had shown you a few minutes ago. Instead, we use like a mass as shown here. The basic principle of angular rate gyroscope simply lies in the fact that there is a proof mass such as this and that is said to be free to move in two directions. You can call this. Um, x axis that is in this direction and another is the y axis local and we have intentionally shown that the thing is 
rotated. If I think of this frame, okay, this frame, if you think of a box or the thing, that is actually rotating, that is what is shown here. Rotating with an angular rate omega, an angular acceleration omega dot. Both the terms we saw in the little derivation that we did, but we thought that if you use Coriolis force, there is mass that is important, an angular rate that we want to measure is coming along and the angular uh, and the linear velocity that we are setting into motion. When you say this is a drive one, we first take this proof mass just like the pendulum and let it vibrate in this direction. Okay? We let the mass vibrate in this direction, mass vibrate in this direction. Okay? And if the frame starts rotating, okay, then we start seeing a motion here. Okay? This motion in this direction occurs because of rotation of the frame, rotation of the frame whose rotation rate is what we are want to measure. So, we set it into motion, if you do not see any motion in the perpendicular direction, then you can conclude that this frame is not rotating. When you start seeing the motion, then you know that it is rotating and how much motion occurs here will tell you at what rate this frame is rotating. That is the principle of the angular rate sensor that happens because of the Coriolis force that we discussed. So, when there is motion in one direction and there is angular rate in another direction, let us say angular rate happens to be in this direction that is this direction and motion in this direction, right hand rule if you follow the perpendicular one is going to be the motion that comes. In other words, the energy put into one axis gets transferred to the perpendicular axis. That is why the Foucault pendulum changes its plane of oscillation. Okay? So, how does it look like in reality for a micro machine uh, gyroscope such as a small chip that I showed a few minutes ago that might have an element such as what is shown here in three different ways. Okay? Let us uh, first look at this uh, wheel gyro as it is uh, called. Okay, this is the wheel gyro. This Bosch company makes a micro machine wheel gyro and in fact that is what you may be familiar with as a gimbal wheel. Gimbal wheel is you have a disc that can rotate about let us say x axis, it can rotate about the y axis and it can also rotate about z axis. So, you have a disc that can rotate about all three axis that is a gimbal wheel which is used uh, to demonstrate experiments in physics and also in some of the macro scale gyroscopes. So, now if there were to be a rotation set along x, okay, so you take this uh, disc and let it oscillate about the x axis. Okay, so, it starts oscillating like this. Whenever this omega that we want to measure happens, then that rotation will get transferred to rotation along the y axis. So, x and y are equivalent axis, you are driving the x axis and when there is angular rate y axis motion you start seeing. Once you know that there is motion on the y axis, rotation about the y axis, then you would say that oh my frame is rotating, the, the frame that is uh, this substrate which is attached to a car or a uh, aircraft or something is uh, actually uh, tilting and that is what we would uh, try to measure. Similarly, we have another one here which is called tuning fork gyroscope. Gyro is a, a short form for gyroscope. This has a tuning fork as you can see there are two tines here and here. Okay, on, on this side also. Now, what happens is if you start let us say this is the drive side that is you take these things and set into motion, they start moving and they have coupled ones, so they also start moving. So, you do not see they both of them will be just moving tuning forks uh, if I have two fingers uh, these fingers are set into motion either uh, in phase like in phase like this okay, 
are out of phase like this. Okay. If I have such a thing, now when there is angular rate about let us say the axis perpendicular to this chip, okay, I am moving like this, suddenly there is an angular rate about this axis. So, if I use right hand rule, my uh, so first let us say that these two tines can move in phase like this or they can go out of phase like this tuning fork. Now, let us say I have put them in phase like this. Now, if there were to be an angular rate about this axis, so this is the angular rate and I have motion this way, let us say one tine is moving like this, then that tine will experience a force due to Coriolis force upwards, other one moving like this that is if I flip it that will be downwards. So, these two tines are I will demonstrate with my hands if I am setting motion like this. Okay. So, when uh, both of them are going like this, both of them will experience a force to go out of plane like this, but if I take them move like this. So, they are moving like this. Now, because of Coriolis effect if there is an angular rate in this direction that is pointing like this, then one of them will start experiencing force like this, other one will go like this, they will go. So, they are moving like this, the once there is angular rate while they are moving like this, they will also moving like this, so they will they will go like this okay. and that you can measure on the other side, this is the sense side, this is the drive side. Okay. Let us use uh, a different color, this is the drive side, this is the sense side. Okay. You can measure that with a tuning fork <coughs> or we can have a dual mass, a Draper lab in the US uh, has this dual mass gyro or gyroscope to finish it that is a short form gyro. Here there are two masses, there is mass 1 and mass 2 and they are set into motion in the oscillation the same way. So, both masses will be because of the comb drive that we had discussed earlier. So, we have the comb drive here, 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 here okay. that will make the two masses move like this. Okay. Now, when there is angular rate about the axis perpendicular to the plane, when one moves like this, other is moving like this. Let us consider the one that moves like this. If I apply the right hand rule, then uh, this is the motion, this is there, it starts having a motion like this. Okay. Then it starts moving this way, other will start move that way. But the way this works is different. This is an in plane axis gyroscope, that is they are moving like this. If there is an angular rate about this axis in plane, this is where we have set the motion and this is the angular rate, then one starts going up, the other one I should not use left hand, but I just need to turn it like this, right? this motion goes like this, then it starts going up. So, the two masses going like this, when there is angular rate about this axis, then one starts going up, other starts going down. So, in addition to going like this, they will start doing this. The while while going, it is hard to do, they will start doing this kind of elliptical motion, but out of phase, when this is up this is down, when that is up, this is down. Okay. That is how the gyroscope works. You need two components that are set into motion and one of them goes one way, other goes the other way. So, we have three concepts, the wheel gyro, dual mass and a tuning fork. There are also more kinds that uh, we can have one element which is what we kept showing in many lectures that is a gyroscope. This gyroscope uh, has matched frequencies and it is important to have them matched because otherwise at resonance we put it a resonance to have maximum amplitude with minimum effort and the other one also should be have the same frequency. So, energy from this mode natural mode which we talked about natural frequency in the, con in the context of vibrations there is also a mode meaning that if I take a, a beam let us say I fixed it at both ends. Okay. The, in the first mode, fundamental mode, this beam is going to vibrate like this, it will go up and down, okay. it will go up and down like this, that is the first mode. The second mode for this is going to be asymmetric and it is going to be like this with 0 slope here, goes up and comes down and that way, okay. it is going to vibrate like this and so forth. Third one will cross, cross one more time, that is it is 0 slope, goes down, goes up and comes like this. In other words, it will oscillate back and forth like that. Okay. This is the first mode, second mode and third mode. These mode shapes 
if I have a mass that has the frequency corresponded so this is f 1, f 2 and f 3. So, f 1 will be less than f 2 is less than f 3 this is the first mode, second mode, third mode, but if I have two of these equal which is what is case here because it has a symmetric suspension in x and y directions. So, it is a frequency of oscillation in this direction will be same as in this direction. If I set it to motion one direction because of angular rate that will be there perpendicular to the uh, plane of this one, then what we see is that it will start moving in the other direction. So, by measuring capacitance in this direction, if this is the drive let us say drive direction is horizontal no, okay, horizontal is this way and this is the sense <coughs> direction. Okay. If there is angular rate above again if you apply the right hand rule this is the angular rate perpendicular to the uh, proof mass plane and this is the drive one they will start having motion in the sense direction. So, this is again the angular rate direction perpendicular to the mass this is the drive and there will be motion in this direction that is sense direction we can measure that and get the angular rate and we already discussed the reason because then we will have how much velocity we give in this direction and also the mass of it and the angular rate they work out as gains. And this is a gimbal type of arrangement this is a two axis mirror and if I put this third axis if I put a similar uh, torsional springs for this so that it can tilt about this other axis then I can use this also a uh, a wheel gyroscope. Okay. There are also other ways that you can sense and uh, one of them we will uh, see the dual mass here first there is a mass 1 here and a mass 2 both of them you can oscillate and uh, uh, they are set into resonance in one mode in the presence of angular rate they start going other way one goes this way other goes that way you can sense that and try to measure the angular rate. There are also other uh, ways that you can uh, see and just while we are at this slide let us see that uh, drive magnitude of this is the order of 10 microns very small displacement, but high frequency it can sense input rotation of let us say 10 degree per second and output response that case will be 1 nanometer. So, 10 microns if you put you get much less displacement due to Coriolis because the masses here are very small angular rate 10 degree per second is uh, also uh, not very high, but the mass the fact that mass is very small and the drive magnitude 10 microns and frequency may be high that may be higher, but for a typical response may 1 nanometer very small displacement and due to 1 nanometer displacement you have to see what capacitance change occurs and be able to measure it. So, people have always been on the lookout for different concepts for the gyroscopes. Let us look at this ring gyroscope which is popular people have made these uh, ring gyroscopes. Let us discuss that uh, ring gyroscope concept by going back to our notepad ring gyroscope or people for short they call it ring gyro. The way this works is if I have let us say a wine glass wine glass ok this circular one if I just hit it you will hear a sound ok. The sound is because this is actually like a ring ok you can take several slices everywhere these starts vibrating that is if I if I take a perfectly circular ring ok set it into motion free vibration which is what we discussed in the last lecture and reviewed today uh, for 10 minutes. If I take this in vibrations if I look at one mode of this is going to make the circle into an ellipse and there will be another mode which is also an ellipse, but that will be at a 45 degree angle. So, the angle between these two okay, is going to be so angle between major as that ellipse and this exit this ellipse. 40 degrees that is if you take a wine glass if you hit it there are two modes that have the same frequency both are ellipses that is one case this uh, wine glass becomes ellipse this way other case it becomes ellipse at a 45 degree angle that is why we see a ringing sound the bead sound 
ting, ting, ting like this. That is the beats you are familiar, if there are two frequencies combined into one frequency, we will see a phenomenon called beats. So, it will increase, decrease and then increase and then decrease the ringing phenomena. Okay. That is what happens here because there are two degenerate modes. We call if two frequencies are the same, they are called degenerate modes or degenerate frequencies. All of these because of symmetry in x and y, we had this frequency equal, the same thing will be there for the ring gyroscope also. So, if I take a ring okay, and let us say ring cannot be free when you use it in a device. So, we will take a central post and attach it with some suspension. Normally, people use it like semicircular spokes. You can use straight spokes also, there are advantages to semicircular one. Okay. Let us say I have this 8 spokes like this and it is fixed at the center. So, the center post is the one that is fixed. Other than this, the red portion will mark it. Everything else is free to move. Imagine that we have a substrate where you made a ring with the spokes or only the center. That is, if I look at the side view of this, okay, I am going to have this ring that I will see from the side and then the central post here will be slightly larger and uh, here I can have my substrate. This is the substrate and this is the center fixed or anchored post like a pillar and then we have this as the ring with spokes. Spokes here are semicircular. that is what people have found it to be convenient in terms of design performance. Now, if I put some um, electrode over here all around, okay. let us say I set this into motion, this is my drive mode that is I use this, this, this and this my electrodes activate them, it starts going like this. Going like this meaning it goes like this and like this because the ellipse elongate this way, that way, this way that starts vibrating. If the substrates, substrate has this angular rate omega, then what will happen is that this ring will start having a mode at 45 degrees as we just discussed. Okay. Both omega here, omega 1 and omega 2 both are equal to omega, oh, sorry this is the natural frequency. So, we will use uh, different symbol rather than this. Okay. So, we will have omega 1 for this, omega 2 for this both are equal to omega. So, this is this omega that you want to measure. So, when that angular rate happens, it starts rotating like this. Then if you measure capacitance along these stator electrodes and this moving electrode here, then you will know that angular rate has occurred. That is the principle of the angular rate gyroscope and there are many ways to do that. One of the ways is shown here. See here what we see is a different one. We have the ring and there is a central post just like what we had earlier. So, let us use the red color. This is fixed here. Other than this, everything else is free to move. Now, this has a special property that first uh, if we excite this, this, this and this meaning that you make them oscillate like this. These are curved chromes just like the comb drive with the linear combs. You can also have a curved combs here. It can go and then if you set them into motion, the other ones that is these will start oscillating as is shown here it is fixed only there and the rest of the structure is free to move. Here we see that uh, uh, to the ring there are lot of these combs attached to it and there are two degenerate mode shapes for it. One shape is uh, such that this one, this one, this one and this one that is these four sets of combs oscillate okay. that is as shown over here they oscillate about this point, this point, this point and this point that is one mode shape. 
and the other mode shape is as shown here where these two things that I am checking with two arrows these four this about that point about this point about this point and about this point it will go like this as it is shown. So, when we set let us say this one into oscillation that is that is our drive mode the sense mode the other set will start oscillating by measuring the capacitance of these comb fingers that is that one that one that one and that one we can sense if there is any angular rate. Again it happens because of Coriolis acceleration transferring energy from one mode to another mode. So, this is the principle of micro machine gyroscopes. This is also the principle of our macro machine ones, but in micro machine gyroscopes we have four different ways of measuring which we discussed in this lecture. And all of these have been made into micro machine devices, some of them are also commercially available especially the dual mass one is commercially available. Ring gyroscopes are not yet commercially available, but they also have shown a lot of promise in terms of research. Thank you. Thank you.